What does it mean to be a man? And how do men uniquely image God? And why is it so necessary for families, cultures, and the church that men live the truth of their masculinity? Join us today as we discuss the masculine genius with Dr. Deborah Savage, professor of theology and philosophy at St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement here at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Uh, today we'll be talking about the masculine genius. Um, Regis Martin, our, our one of our regular panelists here, the Professor of uh, Systematic Theology here at the University. Uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, who holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology in the New Evangelization. And we're joined by Dr. Deborah Savage. Um, you are a Professor of Philosophy and Theology. You're the Director of the Master's Program in Pastoral Ministry at St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity in St. Paul, Minnesota. You have a PhD from Marquette, uh, an MA from the University of St. Thomas. You've written a number of scholarly works, uh, but recently you contributed a chapter to the book um, Promise and Challenge, Women, Catholic Women Reflect on Feminism, Complementarity in the Church uh, by the, symposium, the Catholic Women's Symposium uh, organized by the Ethics and Public Policy uh, Center. So thank you for being with us. I'm so happy to be here, yeah. really. Yeah. This is exciting. Now, as a, as a woman, as a professor, as a scholar, uh, we're talking about um, masculinity and uh, yeah. the genius of man. Right. Um, but for so many years, for centuries really, uh, man has seemed to have an advantage in the world, yeah. academically, professionally, mm -hmm. in so many different ways. But is that changing? Is that shifting in our culture today? Yeah, I think you have to um, start by recognizing it depends on who you, who you talk to okay. and who you're talking about. Certainly for white women, Okay. And certainly for middle class or upper middle class white women in the developed countries, this is absolutely true. Mm. We've been, um, we can now, we're no longer considered property. That was a fairly recent development actually as yeah. the crow flies in history. Uh, we can vote. But beyond that, of course, we can be, we can kind of be anything we want, right? We can go to college, we can uh, take on any position that we wish to pursue. Uh, people argue there's discrimination in um, organizational settings, and that's no doubt true. But women have a lot of freedom. In fact, scholars say that women's liberation is a singular achievement of Western civilization. Mm. But uh, what I like to point out is this is not really true for all women. Okay. Um, women of color, poor women, working poor, are, uh, are I would say, uh, um, don't have the same advantages okay. as um, women in the developed countries or wealthier women in the U.S. Sure. Um, and the strange thing is, is that the wealthier women in the U.S. are the ones that are always yelling about they don't they don't mm -hmm. have enough. Yes. And um, so um, you know, it's important to notice some of the facts. There are more women graduating from college than men now. Right. For every 100 women, 77 men graduate from college. Yeah. And that's a very substantial change. Oh, it is. I, I forget what the date is. It really says, but in 1970, I think it was completely reversed. That's right. That's right. It's been a very rapid development. And so um, I, I think that um, uh, many of the issues that women uh, are so angry about in Western countries, they forget that those are um, really more white women issues, if you know what I mean. Okay, like, okay. And so um, one, one of the things I like about John Paul II's message on all of this, and the thing that I write about is to recognize that feminism, uh, true Catholic feminism, would be a, um, an interest not only in women, but in all of humanity. Sure, sure. So. Sure. I think it's important to notice that you know John Paul is the one who, he might not have coined the phrase the feminine genius, but he certainly universalized it. Yes. 
in all of his teaching, but especially in that one document, Mulieris Dignitatum, right. where he's focusing on this dignity and the vocation of women, and he's applying this notion of, of the, the feminine genius, the, the genius of femininity. And he, he applies it not just to individualism and political rights and equality. Right, right. He really shows that what it has to do with has to do with, among other things, motherhood. Right. But not just biological motherhood, right. but that kind of spiritual gift of self right. that is so peculiar and indispensable for flourishing. Absolutely. And so it's appropriate, I suppose, for a woman to be speaking now of the genius of masculinity. Right. Yeah. You know, when I first started to think about this, and I'll, I can talk more about that at the right time, but I, I remember a day going, how can I have the nerve to talk about or write about the masculine genius? <laughs> I was really pushed to do it, I think to some extent by the Holy Spirit, to tell you the truth. Mm. Um, but, um, and I, then I remembered that John Paul II wrote about women. And von Hildebrand, Dick, Dietrich von Hildebrand says that a woman will be able to see into a man in ways that another man cannot and vice versa. And so I think I can say things that you can't. I mean, imagine a man getting up and talking about the masculine genius now. It'd be, you know, it wouldn't land too well. But I can get up and I can say, I can affirm it and talk about it and explore it uh, in ways that men, men really can't. And yeah, I mean, that, that's beautiful because I mean, what we've seen is Western civilization, really, the influence of Christianity has elevated women, women more oh, in the culture, which is, which is a right. wonderful thing. But we also see a little bit of, in some areas, particularly you just mentioned uh, higher education, where there's a, very, a disproportionate yeah. number of women that are actually benefiting from this, where men are falling behind in some right. areas. So right. is, there, is there this kind of cultural or historical struggle that's now going on? Or is there a crisis, if you will, for boys or for men? Absolutely. I mean, this is documented. A good book to get on it is Boys Adrift by Dr. Uh, Sachs, Leonard Sachs. Yeah. Um, and it's very clear that our educational system, so many factors, uh, uh, so many things in our culture are now driven by a concern for girls and women that the boys are getting left behind. Mm. Um, for example, just one example, um, girls develop differently than boys do and certain uh, skills or uh, their, their brain functioning uh, developed so that little girls can read at an earlier age than boys can. But now when you go to kindergarten, you're expected to do what we used to expect first graders to do, right? And so it looks like the boys aren't quite with it, but actually it's just a developmental issue which all evens out between the ages of 12 and 14. But you put a boy in that situation and then you tell him that he must be stupid that's right. Or you imply that he is, or you, or you think maybe he needs ADHD or ADD medication, which is what often happens. Um, and the, the boy has a bad taste in his mouth forever after about school. Yeah. And it, it becomes a kind of girl thing to be a good student. Mm -hmm. And so there's just all sorts of uh, data on this, not just in education, but in uh, social situations. Um, boys don't like to sit still. They like to go out and play. Well, now we don't have so much recess, right? Right, right. And it, yeah, the, kindergarten it's, used to be heavily just play. Right, and, now it's and very it still different. should be, really. So the educational system has been redesigned to ensure that women or girls have a voice, and in doing so, uh, they have uh, designed classroom environments so that uh, the boys' needs are really not yeah. being met. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me uh, uh, confess uh, straight away my own misgivings because I, I think uh, I in particular labor under certain impediments. I'm a guy uh, and this business of, of masculine genius is very strange, uh, very alien to me. I, I understand being masculine because indisputably I am, but a genius, that particular cachet, uh, I don't own, I don't share. Uh -huh. And men are typically not terribly self-conscious. They're, right. they're intent on doing things. They're, they're right. activists, right. other directed. Uh, so to think about myself is, is always awkward. Uh, we're not as introspective right. as, as women. Plus, I think women have an edge metaphysically because they're closer to the mystery. Right. You know, they have this capacity, which right. they're reminded of right. uh, every month, of, of being co-creators. Right. Well, I, 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 maybe in a little while we'll talk more specifically about what I think that genius is the masculine genius. Yeah, I'd like to know about it. But, okay, yeah, yeah. I believe that's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. um, 
uh, what I want to say right away is that things have gotten so out of balance that what used to be natural for men and women in the way they would express themselves in, in the family, in, in culture, ha it has gotten so uh, distorted <clears throat> that it's actually necessary, I say, for us to, r to make explicit what we think these different contributions are, these different charisms are that men and women each contribute because it's sort of like we need to become consciously competent in that regard now because uh, being unconscious about them um, uh, won't, won't serve future generations. I think, I think everything begins with self-knowledge and men need to be affirmed in the genius they possess that without which civilizations would not have been built. We'd still be living in caves. Yeah. It, it is vital, I think, in the conversation that we acknowledge differences which are fixed, unalterable. I mean, wasn't it Freud who said uh, anatomy is destiny? Uh, and you can't really break that mold. Uh, yeah. Men can't bear children, but right. women uniquely may. Right. And yeah. that division, that difference, I think is pretty instructive, pretty striking, and it, yeah. it sort of gets applied all the way down the line. Yeah. At, at the same time, what you're doing is somewhat iconoclastic given our culture. I mean, because this idea of gender having significance, masculinity having a genius, I mean, gender is a social construct, you know, oh. which is the greatest. That's what they tell us. Well, I mean, yeah. that is the social construct, right. to, to think that gender is right. a social construct. Right. But at the same time, you know, there is, a, I remember reading a book by Illich years ago, and I wasn't too sympathetic toward him, but he, he pointed out something, you know, when you contrast the modern with the medieval, the modern does think in terms of individualism, and thus they reduce it to gender, right. male and female. And he points out in the medieval sources, they didn't think in terms of male and female, they thought in terms of husband, wife, uh -huh. mother, father, right. daughter, you know, right. son, brother, Personal. sister, because there's a relational matrix that is the actual right. fabric of being, yeah. a relational ontology that makes us more than just male or female, it makes us a, a, a son or a yeah, daughter. Absolutely, so, I mean, yeah. what we forget is that complementarity, male and female, characterizes all of creation. It's not just men and women, human beings that are right. reflect a kind of complementarity. But especially this institution that has now been trivialized as banal, that is the family, right. the extended family. Exactly. Right. Because so we they're, see it in that context. In yeah. That's right. And so the, you know, deconstructing the family is, is nearly complete, and the last vestiges are gender. Right. Oh, and right. so we have, we have the academic institutions that are really uh, uh, trying to elevate women. Again, a, a noble cause, but sometimes at the, at the, at expense, the expense of, of the As individuals, men. not women. Correct, correct. And then, yeah, then you also point. throw in, I mean, the sociological reality that we have many homes growing up without fathers present. Oh, my gosh. You know, and, and, and that's got to add to this yeah. crisis, too. Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, 71% um, of all African-American mm -hmm. children are born to families without fathers, or born, you know, without a father in the home anyway. And um, so that's a stunning statistic all by itself. A one statistic I read, I'm not sure if I believe it, said 50% of all boys have no, are in a home without a father. I'm not sure about that. But it, the, the situation is dramatic, and it's a crisis. And what you learn is that, strangely, or maybe not so strangely, this uh, situation affects boys in ways that are significantly different from that, the effect it has on girls. Now, I know we want to talk about the fact that little girls need fathers too, and they That's do. Right. The single most important person in a little girl's life is going to be her father right. for lots of good reasons. <clears throat> but um, little boys, <clears throat> and this maybe gets back to Regis's point, little boys need to be taught how to be a man. They need to see what it means to be a man. Whereas a woman, I would say, she has this built into her, this kind of capacity for persons, for other persons, yeah. is, a, is a part of her body, but also a part of her, not just her body. It's not just biological determinism, as JP2 says. There's an ontological and physical reality that's at work. But boys need to be taught how to do it because to be a man is a more external reality. And there's no male models anymore, everyone's been de de Well, that datum uh, you gave us about 70% of black children yes. uh, are born without fathers. Right. That's absolutely dismaying. 
Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, there's this Black Lives Matter oh movement, which seems to be yeah. targeting police, demonizing the police. Right. In fact, if Black Lives Matter, they matter at the very first moment of right. conception, there ought to be a father there. That's where the yeah. injustice begins. Yes. The beginning there is, and they... Yeah. Well, there's this misconception that to be a father is simply uh, a momentary thing, right. and I participated right. and now I'm done. No, the, uh, the father is to be protector, provider, teacher, and he is, he is not only responsible for um, sharing his, uh, being generative in that regard, he's responsible for being generative in terms of helping the child lay out their path, understand their destiny, all of these things. To be a father is not merely a biological reality any more than to be a mother is merely a biological reality. And I have to add that uh, there is now a causal connection between a fatherless home and poverty. Uh, women without a husband in the home, that family is six times more likely to be poor, be live below the poverty line, than a family with a father living with the children and the, mm -hmm. and the mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it used to be just a correlation, now it's causal. It's a predictor of poverty. Yeah. No, we, yeah. we, we were talking about the crisis. I want to yeah. continue this in the yeah. next conversation, talking to Regis's direct point. Uh, let's go a little deeper into what it means to be a man and the genius of man. Stay with us. When the church talks about the masculine and feminine genius, they aren't trying to impose something from outside on us. They're not trying to make all women be one thing and all men become another. And it's not somebody else's idea of who we're supposed to be. What the church is doing is helping us understand who God made women and men to be in scripture and helping us discover who we are. So it's really a finding, not an imposition. There are a million ways to be a woman and to be nurturing life. There are a million ways to be a man and to be protecting life. Each of us gets the great joy and privilege of discovering what way God is asking us to do that. People recognize Franciscan University as being academically excellent and passionately Catholic. We have the unique opportunity through our faculty members, through our students, to proclaim that academic excellence by reaching out in many different ways. We also remain passionately Catholic in the way in which we are able to worship, the way in which we are able to uh, bring that love of Christ to others on a daily basis. It's important for us to be able to embrace both. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking with scholar and professor, Dr. Deborah Savage. Um, we're talking about the, the masculine genius. Yes. Regis had the question, we all have the question, what is that? What, what does it, it look like? What is the, well, what is the let, genius of man? Or? Yeah, let me preface this by saying something that might be a little bit controversial, um, but that never stops me. <laughs> um, I think it's okay to, to consider the possibility that when John Paul II uses the word genius to describe the feminine, the feminine, he's using it as mostly a rhetorical device. Okay. The word we might, and so the Thomists among us, I count myself in that group, get a little nervous around that word, right? What does that actually mean? What kind of property is it? Where does it reside? Is it in the form of the man, you know? Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, he's clearly describing a phenomenological reality, however. Anybody with a mom knows about the feminine genius, okay? But I think a better word, a, a word that maybe has more weight and meaning in the tradition is the word charism. Mm -hmm. I think men and women do have distinct charisms. So that's a starting place, so if that helps, I don't know. Yeah, I don't um, so. Yeah. Now, um, I derive the both, I have a theory actually of both the masculine and the feminine genius. It builds on John Paul II's work, but takes it a bit further. And also I have some different, slightly different insights into it. But I can say that it's the same place in Genesis where he derives so much meaning. Yes. And um, I would just point out that um, um, it maybe starts, there's a lot you have to say about this, but to make it uh, direct. It starts with the recognition that Adam is in the garden alone with God for some time before the appearance of Eve. And this is basically the second account, the second creation account. 
And, and God, noticing that he's alone, brings him every, all the goods of creation, and Adam names them, right? So what I, what I thought, what I realized was that this means that Adam's first contact with reality is of a horizon that contains only things, what we would really lower order creatures, not things like iPods and, and, and hammers, but the, the lower order creatures of creation. And he names every one of them. In so doing, he takes dominion over them. St. Thomas Aquinas says that Adam must have had a distinct preternatural gift, a a, an extra one, in order to have enabled him to do that. Hmm. Adam is the only one who gets a job. He's put in the garden to till it and to keep it. Yeah, and all of that happens before the before fall. Before the fall, yes. <laughs> there's, that's very important. Now, this is man in his original innocence. And so my, I, I thought, you know, that, that explains a lot. We all criticize men, and it's all over the data that men are tending to be more oriented toward things than toward people. My, my argument is that is his gift. Mm -hmm. he, is, he is so, he knows about things. Now, this doesn't mean that he likes toy trucks and hammers. It me, what it turns into is this amazing capacity to declare what should be predicated of something and what cannot be predicated of it. It turns into systems of philosophy, of law, of theology. Of one example that Anthony Esselin uses is um, base, the baseball card statistics oh, thing. Sure. I mean, how do you calculate who's a good, right, ways of, of thinking about things and, and what's true and what's not true, and then systems that, that establish also the criteria by which we can decide if something is true or not true. And so it's very important to realize it's not just, um, you know, men like to watch football. It's, it's this incredible gift that men bring. And I argue that if it weren't for men, again, we would still be living in caves, afraid to come out. Men's genius is what has made possible the, um, the development, the establishment of civilizations. Men's gift is used to uh, support the flourishing of families and of cultures. That, that's a, a, an arresting uh, observation. I, I, I really uh, uh, welcome that. This, this taxonomic office that Adam exercises yes, yes. really distinguishes him oh, absolutely. Uh, from, from, uh, from Eve, and who's not yet on the scene. No. I mean, right. the notion we have is, well, in a state of pre-lapsarian innocence, what you do is you party, you play, you remain oh. idle. Let's go to the beach, right. maybe toss a Frisbee uh, and have a few beers. But right. in fact, he's working. He's oh, subduing the earth, yes. managing without toil or sweat the right. ecosystem. No, that's absolutely true. And John Paul II, in his encyclical on human work, argues, points out that work itself is a fundamental dimension of human existence because the call to work comes before the fall. Yeah. yeah. Here's a thought because you know behind every asset is a liability. You know, yes. with with every plus there's a minus, and so on the one hand the distinctive feature of Adam at this point is the trees and the flowers, the beasts and the, and the birds that he names. Yeah. And yet at the same time, it's clearly the case that man has got to recognize that it's not enough. And this is why in the narrative it says, it is not good that man is alone. You know, everything up until then has been good, 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 very good. Yeah. But it is not good. And John Paul points this out because you know, a suitable helper was not found for him. Yeah. Well, obviously found not by God, because God knew there was no, none of these were gonna be suitable helpers. And so man had to be shown these animals right. in a certain sense to see what is in, inside of him, that, that capacity to, for taxonomy. Right. But at the same time, there was a self-discovery yeah. that comes through the sleep, the deep sleep, the tardama, from which he awakens, and he has one more to name. Right. And he names Isha, right. for he she does. comes from yes. the Ish. Right. And at the same time, I think there's a personal exodus because he's, he's coming out of himself, not just the rib, mm -hmm. but the very person who is, you know, who is alone, as it were. Original right. solitude as, a, as well as original innocence, That's he points right. out. And the very fact that it is not good that man is alone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if we were in the beatific vision, just alone as an individual with the Trinity, we wouldn't be lonely. 
You know, so this underscores the fact that this is a probationary state. This is a preparation for man to take hold of his genius, but to recognize that he needs something more, that he right. bears the image of, of God. But right. the beauty of that image is resplendent, not in himself so much as in the, you know, if he's the crown of creation, she's the crown jewel. You know, it, it seems to me that there's a double deprivation here that Adam has to uh, endure. On the one hand, even though he and God walk in the cool of the evening in a kind of companionable silence, he can't see him, he can't touch him. There's no tangibility. Uh, he needs something he can sink his teeth into. He needs genuine encounter. And that's the other deprivation. He needs woman. He needs a vis-a-vis. Uh, so that this solitude can be shared solitude. And it could be that he stays so busy because that's the only way to keep boredom and sadness at well, bay. Well, I think uh, Scott's point is really a good one that it's, it's by this progression of, okay, here's something else. What about this? What about this? Yeah. God reveals to him that something is really missing. Yeah. And then Eve comes along and he says, this at last right. is yeah. bone of my bones. This is what I've been missing. Yeah. But he knows, and he names her too, but he knows that she is not an object. Now, that's important. That's yeah. extreme. Yeah, so he's no longer the steward in the same sense. No, well, she's a, no, she's a person. She's a he's equal. That's right. She's a that's person. Right. And this and, and this intersubjectivity that I have not had until now. Right. That's right. significant. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so um, uh, maybe it's okay to say now that original sin throws this off, doesn't it? That it's, after original sin. Um, uh, Adam now will, will struggle with creation. The very thing that was his charism, his gift, will now become a source of difficulty. And um, his blindness now is that he thinks of everything as an object, including woman and so on. And so uh, what's so significant about this in, in relation to what Scott just said and this notion of all the things being presented to him is that the truth is that to, if I'm to discover myself through becoming a gift, of, making of myself a gift to someone, I cannot forget that that can only be a gift given to another person. Yeah, yeah. I cannot make of myself a gift to a bottom line, to a cleaning out the garage, yeah. to mowing the lawn, to a or a, pet dog, or pet yeah. dog, or fantasy <laughs> football, or whatever. Right. To make of myself a gift requires a reciprocal exchange with a person. Yeah. Yeah. So, w yeah, would you say powerful. that that woman has an advantage here because when she awakens uh, into a state of consciousness, Adam is already there. Well, she has is, the appropriate vis-a-vis. -vis. So, to make a gift of herself seems almost effortless, right. natural. Oh, no, that's right. In fact, in my, uh, my theory, this is so excellent, really. Um, my argument is that in, uh, when, when Eve uh, awakens, her first contact with reality is of a horizon that includes Adam. Yeah, yeah. So John Paul argues that this feminine genius is grounded in the fact that women are meant to be mothers, and I don't disagree with that at all. He was criticized some because there's a hint that people would say it doesn't mean it at all, but he, you know, biological determinism seems to loom behind that. Uh, the feminists are always on the lookout for you right. trying to make me go back into the kitchen or something. <laughs> yeah. um, I say actually that prior to that reality, there is a moment in scripture where we can see that Eve's first contact would be of Adam. Yeah. And women are marked forever after because of the order in which they are created. So while, while the horizon that surrounds and encompasses Adam is really bereft of the other. I mean, yeah, God is right. there, but that's he right. can't see him. And alone. Eve is yes. not yet there, right. so he feels alone. Right. But let's be clear that um, Adam's orientation toward things needs to be understood in light of the fact that the things of creation also have what the philosophers would call ontological status. They are not just inanimate objects with no meaning. They are all held in existence by God in the same way that human beings are. So they're lower ordered creatures, but they they have they have weight. They have yeah. And so if, so, we, yeah. so if we see if we see man both in his in the original sense and both as himself over uh, lower creatures, yeah. but also in complementarity. We understand him more in a complementarity to a, a woman. Right. Where's this gift of masculinity kind of revealed in the family, in the home? Oh in my a gosh. Way? How much time do we have? <laughs> you know? um, well, uh, 
Uh, this, this is one insight I gained from reading Nuptial Mystery by Cardinal Scola, Angelo, mm. Angelo Cardinal Scola. He argues that um, in the family, the man introduces the child to what he calls the law of exchange. Mm. The law of exchange refers to this, the reality that nothing is free <laughs> and that the child's job is to, through an exchange with and a recognition of the reality in which they find themselves, they become the person God meant them to be. And mm. this is the man's job. The father lays down the law. I have seen this in my own experience with between the interaction between my husband and my daughter. Andrew can say things and say them in a way that I would never think of. And you know, if you stand back and watch it, you see he's exactly right. He's, he, he's had enough, and this is not how it's going to be in this house. Um, whereas the woman, according to Cardinal Scola, introduces the child to the law of gratuity, a law of unconditional love. And so, and he says that both laws are necessary for a child to flourish, for a family to flourish. A child must feel loved, but they must also understand that that love calls them out of themselves to become the, the tension between mentally. justice and mercy. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, on the one hand, people might say, well, this is Genesis, you know, this is, you know, it's not a scientific documentary oh. as though science is the reducible, you know. On the other hand, it's not mythology either. I, I think what we have here is a glimpse into what it means to bear the image and, uh, and likeness of God. And it really has to do with marriage, yeah. you know, and the marital covenant, and that is the basis of the family. I think. You know, that is the wisdom that we need the Word of God to get to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Stay with us for the next segment of Franciscan University Presents. I am a communication arts major, the president of Film Club, and an editor for Franciscan University Presents. It's really great to be able to work on Franciscan University Presents because it is a national television show on EWTN, and in a lot of other schools you're not going to have that kind of ability to put that on a resume. When I graduate, I know that I'm going to, to be firm in sticking with my faith and you know going to daily mass and a frequent confession and things like that. Because instead of just learning with my mind or just focusing on schoolwork, I, I actually you know can grow with my whole person. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. This entire program springs forth from the very heart of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Uh, we're recording this right now in the studios here at Franciscan University. Uh, our students are operating the, operating the cameras and equipment. Um, our panelists, our theology faculty here at Franciscan University. Um, we've been talking to Dr. Deborah Savage about the gift of man. I prefer that than the genius of man, personally, the charism of man. Um, but, but at the end of the last segment, um, Scott brought up about uh, Genesis and about the, the, the conflict between some people seeing it as a myth versus the real science and the reality yeah. uh, of what's going yeah, on yeah. there. Do you want to well, pick I up think on it's that? extremely important for, <clears throat> for all of us to realize that uh, the science actually d proves the, the, the Genesis account, if you look at it the way I'm suggesting we look at it anyway, is actually right. Because uh, science has shown, there's studies done of, um, of researchers, for example, who, who decided they do this kind of research where they're trying to, sh to see um, if it isn't so that boys and girls develop in certain ways because of conditioning in the home or in society. And they start out assuming that they're going to discover that all of those things are socially constructed. And then, then they discover through, through their research, but then also some of them have their own kids. That's right. That's and right. they realize that no matter what you do, a little boy will make, whatever you give him, he'll, he'll make a sword. Right. <laughs> Or, or a ball out of it, right. you know, or whatever you give a or little make girl. Certain noises when or noises, playing. right. Give him a Barbie doll or a bunch of them, and he's going to play war with them, right? Blow them up. Blow them up, <laughs> that's yeah. right. And, but you, whatever you give a little girl, she wraps it up in a blanket and carries it around. And so they, they really, they're, it's documented that they um, set out to prove they're going to raise their own children without any of these stereotypes. So no pink blankets, no blue blankets, no, you know, no football jerseys, I don't know, whatever they did. 
And then they discover that no matter what you do, little boys act like little boys and little girls act like little girls. And I was telling my mother about all this and she said, well, why couldn't they just call me? Because <laughs> I would we have didn't told need to study. Them, yeah, how much money did that cost? Yeah. So the, the research shows that uh, boys and girl babies exhibit characteristics that are usually attributable to boys and girls at a later age right. within four hours of birth. Yeah, unbelievable. It's, yeah. it's and, significant and ironic that Genesis is not the mythology. No, Rather, right. the mythology is the idea that gender is a social construct. Right. That's what science has shown and, to be and real mythology. And science is it both in the behaviors, no. it's in the, the neurological no. connection. Neuroscience is showing all Complementarity is there. It yeah. is absolutely there. Little boys look at uh, objects, little girls look at faces. Yeah. Little boys will look at the mobile above it, their bed, They'll, little girls will look at your face. Mm -hmm. If you talk to the little girl, she'll look at you even longer, it doesn't matter for boys. Yeah. When, when little boys uh, when in preschool, when new toys arrive, the boys drop what they're doing and go see. When, uh, little, when new children arrive, the girls drop what they're doing and go see. The boys are like, oh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's, I mean, I wish we had more time. I could give you all Or we could spend a whole show the, just yeah, on that. I mean, it's I mean, even just amazing. the hearing and the eyesight and the different Women things. have better peripheral vision. Yeah. We have more rods and cones in our eyes, and that explains why when Maddie's in danger, my husband is, he's not seeing it. But, Focused. But I, <laughs> yeah, because men are, have tunnel vision, and that's a good thing. That's yeah, a that, good thing. That, that seems to confirm what Fulton Sheen had said, yeah. that when God made Adam, he scratched his head and said, you know, I can do better. Oh. <laughs> I mean, this nurturing yeah. instinct, which seems to be consubstantial yes, with her right. being but you know, there, is, there is, is so not much beauty inculcated. It. It's not yeah. culturally conditioned. Yeah. She's sort of coded genetically by design as if God knew that these two prototypes would be quite distinct. Right. Well, one of the things I like to uh, say, I think I can get away with it. Dr. Han may have something to say about this, but um, it seems to me that there's a hierarchy of creation introduced in the first account in Genesis that gets brought to completion in the second. And um, so he, you know, God starts out with the land and the water and so on, and the sea monsters and then creepy crawly things and so on. And then it becomes more personal. That's a kind of cosmic hierarchy. In the second creation account, it's more personal. And yet there is a hierarchy. There's the lower creatures, and then finally, at, uh, you know, or then uh, Adam is created, then there's the lower creatures, and then finally there's Eve. Yeah. Eve is not created second, which is what people have, the reason that people don't like the Genesis account is they think somehow that it, it um, establishes woman as a subservient creature. No, she's not created second, she's created last and on the way up. Yeah, this is where Aristotle helps because what is last in execution is first in intention. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's not just true in creation where the woman is the crown jewel of creation. It's true at the consummation of history as well yeah. where the unveiling of the bride of Christ is there. You know, you can go all the way back to 1930 with Pius XI's encyclical Casti Canubi because he identifies two distinctive orders drawing from St. Augustine. On the one hand, the authority, the order of authority where man is head. The second is the order of love where woman is heart. Now, if you compare authority to love, you can see that authority is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Love is the end. So man's headship is not the be all and end all. It's the means to love. And there a woman has a certain primacy, precisely as the heart, who can perceive with wisdom and love others and their needs and that nurturing thing that man cannot live without. Right, and I, I argue that this is woman's work, right. is to remind men above all, that all human activity must be ordered toward authentic human flourishing. Mm -hmm. And that women have to play that role in the family and in the culture yes. and in every place, everywhere she works. The church teaches, <clears throat> and this is a quote from the compendium on Catholic social thought, the feminine genius is needed in all aspects of the life of society, therefore the presence of women in the workplace must be guaranteed. Right. And, the re and I, I thought about that, I thought, that's because woman's work is to make sure that we never lose sight of the end that you are describing. Yeah, yeah. So when, when it says that um, woman is a helper, the word is azare, 
And that means divine aid. When that word is used elsewhere in scripture, it doesn't mean scullery maid. It doesn't mean the woman who makes the beds. It means divine aid. And woman is sent by God to man to help him to live. Right. And to find himself. Yeah, if, if it, I mean, this is a double-edged sword, I think, because on the one hand, if the task of woman is to sort of civilize the men who love her, to humanize uh, the home, uh -huh. the cosmos, at the same time, when she falls, when she fails, tumbles down from that right. summit of right. the stairs she occupies by nature, right. uh, that crash is fairly resounding. And we see this uh, nowadays, especially. No, that's right. Um, I, I've given some thought to this, and we generally think, blame, um, or say that Eve was tricked by the serpent because she was naive or she didn't know really what was happening. And I prove in one of my essays that actually that's not the right way to think about Eve. She's an, uh, she's, um, an instantiation of the same substantial form. She has the same human soul. Yeah. She has reason, intellect, and will. Um, Eve is nobody's fool. The serpent went to Eve because he knew that if he, sh if he got Eve, he'd get Adam. That's right. Now, Adam fails in that moment because that was his opportunity to be protector. Right. He's more sophisticated about things. He's, he got the word directly from God, don't touch that tree. Yeah. And he should have said at that point, Eve, no, I, that's not a problem. That's not a good idea. She's yeah, unsophisticated protect. with regard to things. Um, but I, I really do think that when you corrupt a hierarchy, you start at the top. And, um, and, and I, sh I want to back up, though, and make sure we say that the full phrase in Scripture is, is there negdo, conegdo, right? And conegdo is a preposition, meaning in front of, in the spatial sense. So you have to be careful that we don't imply that women are somehow better than men. But nonetheless, um, I think well, that's you know, what Shakespeare, happens. Well, you know, Shakespeare has the sense yes. of it when he yeah. says, lilies that fester, they smell worse than weeds. Right. And the worst corruption is the corruption of the best. I, I don't mind yes. putting a woman uh, at, at the summit, yeah. the pinnacle, but at the same time, she has to acknowledge, this is a real challenge that I need grace uh, right. to find myself equal in discharging. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, let me trump Shakespeare with St. Paul. <laughs> oh, okay. What Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, I think is often misunderstood. He speaks of man as being the image of God and then the woman as being the glory of man, which people take wrongly to imply that she's not the image of God. The point is that the image of God that is born both by male and female is most gloriously re resplendent in the beauty of the woman. And it kind of helps us to see that when man falls and woman falls, it's different. You know, man is given dominion. So when he falls, he tends toward domination. Woman is given glory, beauty. And so when she falls, she, gives, she falls into vanity, vainglory, that sort of thing. And I, I think that combination also sort of helps us to step back and gain wisdom when it comes to our own culture. Yeah. Because, you know, when suddenly that complementarity gives way to competition, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. then suddenly not only are the children suffering, but, you know, just as Adam was hiding, you know, we're alienated from our very selves, not just from spouses and that kind of thing. I, I also want to point out that it's not just a spousal thing for the wife. You know, I have six kids, five boys and one girl, and, and Hannah has always been the one who sort of with her humor and with her uh, just the way that she, it's sororal. I mean, as a sister, she is the one who kind of unites us on vacation, but growing up as well. Uh, it was something that I saw in my mother as well when she was with her siblings. Uh, there really is a unitive capacity uh, that brings communion. So, so let me ask you, just kind of going off of that point, what, what can women do in embracing their genius and embracing their femininity to help men live our charism yes. of masculinity? Well, um, there's, again, how much time yeah. do you have? Um, first of all, I think they have to become conscious about this genius or charism that men really have. I am so grateful every day to my husband and to my father, for that matter, for the fact that um, what my husband, what men do is they work. Mm -hmm. they, and they work without thanks. When I do something in the house, I'm waiting for my husband to notice, not Andrew. He just does it because that's how he is. This is uh, St. Joseph, is just goes to work, right? He's silent and he goes to work. And so I think the first thing mm -hmm. is that women need to be grateful to men 
for their very being, for how they are, and to affirm that. I mean, we can't forget ever that original sin is still influencing us, right? And Adam's sin is now, he thinks of everything as an object, and Eve's sin is that she now will struggle with relationships, right? Sure. So um, a, a woman needs to be aware of this, that um, she tends to take things personally, right? And she um, is sort of, like you say, kind of vain and always thinking about herself. It's true that women are more introspective, but actually that becomes navel-gazing at a certain point or an obsession with self. So I would say that would be the first thing is to, to uh, acknowledge men. And woman, woman can do that in a way that's been missing and that without it, we won't get anywhere. Women, men need to realize again, once again, that they have a nature and they get to be men, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess I would also add that, and this is um, hidden in the message of Mulieris Dignitatum, that women need to find themselves also a voice um, that isn't strident, that isn't shrill, don't become the angry woman that everyone fears, uh, to, to make my contribution in a way that isn't, um, uh, you know, feminine in the pink sense, but is more like the femininity that Mary would have displayed, which is sort of, it has a real weight. It's recollected. It ha Mary and women have their own authority, and they need to make that contribution in the family and in the workplace without getting defensive or, um, you know, so that the men around them are not walking on eggshells all the time, afraid of offending them. Get into the fray, but get into the fray as a woman. Don't try to imitate what men do. It's so unbecoming, yeah, yeah, right? And unnecessary. Yeah. And unnecessary, no. There's nothing worse than a shrill, strident woman who's always got her fists up, right? And I have found that women have enormous power. It's obvious. Women have enormous power, and they're misusing it. And they're misusing it in the direction of really destroying the family. Women have participated in that in a very big way. So. Stay with us for the final segment of Franciscan University Presents. Women and men can't live the masculine and feminine genius in a vacuum. We have to live it together. And for women in particular, the best way that we can help men be the men God is calling them to be is to become the women that God is calling, women God is calling us to be. So that means that we are to receive life, we're to receive people into our world, men and women alike, to give them a place where they feel at home and feel loved. We are to be encouragers, we're to affirm and cheer people on and help them to become the best person they can be. Uh, we're going to be prayer warriors. You know, if you look at the women in scripture, they were praying left, right, front, and center for the men and the women around them. And ultimately, that's the most important thing we can do for the men we love and for our women friends, is go to God and implore Him for all the graces they need to be the person that He made them to be. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy, and you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents in our final segment, and we've been talking about the, the genius of man. Uh, we'll start us off with Dr. Regis Martin. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, so much for coming uh, oh, and yeah. sharing your insights, but uh, more importantly, your feminine presence. Uh, oh. And the differences are so obvious and endearing. Uh, you're wonderfully soft-spoken. Oh. We, we tend to shout, yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, that's uh, instructive. Uh, so many of the things we've been uh, talking about catalyze uh, thoughts that swirl about in my own head. But in particular, I was thinking about something that Jacques Maritain had said. He said that it was the task of Adam to interpret the dreams that Eve had. And 
that, I think that is uh, useful to know because she's intuitive. Uh, she has this mystic uh, hold and bond. But Adam's job is to externalize it, to give it form and expression, right. to work at it. But that also implies that she's going to let him do that, make provision for Adam to be labor intensive. He needs to work. That's how he fulfills his being. That's where he finds his identity. And I'm also uh, uh, struck by this, that the levels of fulfillment that we find uh, are, are sort of uh, myriad. Uh, to begin with, we have to subdue the world we know, the environment, the material order. It has to be domesticated. And that, I think, is chiefly the task of man. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, since that doesn't exhaust the possibilities of being human, we need interpersonal uh, relations. We need love, fraternity uh, among men and women. And here, women, I think, uh, are sort of uh, the experts. Uh, they shepherd us uh, in the ways of love. But finally, we need God. There has to be room, uh, there has to be provision made for prayer, for adoration. And again, I, I think women have a natural edge because they are closer to the mystery. It was Lewis, C.S. Lewis, who said that in relation to God, we're all feminine. And it's not an accident that the church is not masculine. She's feminine, a woman, a virgin, a mother, Mary. And so they have an easier time of it. Uh, there are more mystics, I think, who are women than men. I, I haven't done an inventory, but it wouldn't surprise me if that's true. They have an easier time of getting into the kingdom because they have a kind of connaturality with, uh, with the furniture of, of paradise. Uh, they'll be up there like Martha, just sort of uh, dusting the place, uh, making it uh, ready for their menfolk when we arrive, uh, belatedly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Regis. Scott? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for the work you're doing. It's really good. It's, it's wise. It's profound. Not only the way you incorporate scripture with theology, but the way you combine philosophy and theology as well with Aquinas and John Paul and all of that. But you also then combine theology with psychology and apply it in practical ways that I think we can all learn a lot from. Uh, two takeaways. Number one, you know, I, I think back years ago to when I was reading an Old Testament scholar who pointed out that men's roles are not reducible to priest, prophet, and king. With the emergence of the monarchy came a whole new figure called the sage, you know, the wise man, Proverbs, and all of the rest. And, you know, it was a call to men to recognize the fact that you're not just, you know, slaves to pleasure, you're not just going to be into athletics, that there's a time to contemplate and ponder and grow in wisdom as a sage. And it really, it changed my outlook in many ways way back. The second thing that I think of is that the Blessed Virgin Mary, she is the seed of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so just as she introduces Jesus to the world, in a certain sense, you know, she even introduces Jesus to himself, teaching him to walk and talk and all of that. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, as Lady Wisdom, kind of echoes for me the fact that in Proverbs that is written by the sage, wisdom, hakma, is a woman. Not only a divine image, but even in Proverbs 31, that woman of wisdom is a wife and a mom and a, she's like a little, she's Kimberly. I mean, when I read that, I see her. But the Blessed Virgin Mary to me is the one who makes it safe to be a male and a female, you know, and so I have found in our family experience total consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary has become a wellspring, a fountainhead of divine grace, precisely as the men and the women in our family have discovered in her the source of wisdom, as well as Christ himself who is wisdom. So I, I thank you for the ways that you're doing it, you know, it's like from above the theoretical, the academic, and yet from below the personal and the practical. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. I'm honored that you say that. I, I would add this, that um, we th tend to think of complementarity um, with JP2's help as a reflection of the marital act or the uni-duality that characterizes men and women. This is what he calls it. But in his letter to women, and then again in the Compendium for Catholic Social Thought, this is echoed, he says that he, men and women not only make families together, we make history together. Mm -hmm. And that complementarity is actually our mission, gives us our mission. And I want to end with this because I think it's enormously important that we realize that unless we get this straight, 
unless we help our young people understand that it's okay to be a man, to be a woman, and invite them to a fuller expression of both of those things. Our, our civilization, I don't have a good feeling yeah. <laughs> about what's yeah. coming next. And it's really the question of our era, you know. And so whenever I talk to young people, young men, young women, um, the same questions come up. The confusion that exists in our culture right now about what those things mean to be a man, to be a woman, who's supposed to call, who isn't, all that. It's, it's so very sad, you know. And um, I think we have, um, as you know, sages in the making, we have the responsibility to help our young people grapple with the realities behind all of that and return us to a saner understanding of who man and woman is. I don't think it's, I think it's true that we've never actually had an adequate account of complementarity in our tradition. And I think John Paul II says in uh, Christi Fidelis Leici that the only way woman will find her place in the church and in the world is by a real deep uh, exploration and articulation of the nature of woman in relation to man. And in a way, that's what I've been working on. I know Pope Francis says we need a theology of women. I, I'll, I'll follow him anywhere, whatever he says. That's fine with me. But I've been waiting for him to call me, actually. <laughs> um, because what I really want to say to him is, Holy Father, God bless you. I don't think we need that. I think we need a theology of complementarity. Yeah. Because it cashes out in ecclesiology, which we haven't spoken about at all. But it's, sure. it's got implications for the body of Christ, yes, yes. very definitely. Excellent. Excellent. Well, if you've enjoyed uh, today's program, uh, we have a free handout for you from uh, Dr. Savage here. Is there a, a masculine genius? You can get this at faithandreason.com or just for asking. Um, truly, this is the question of our times. This is the uh, issue uh, uh, that we are all grappling with and challenged with. And uh, it really brings to mind that, that passage uh, or that, that quote from uh, St. Catherine, uh, if, if you are who you were meant to be, you would set the world on fire. And we need to embrace who we are, the giftedness, the talents, the, the beauty that God has us as men and women, and really truly uh, share that with the world because our world is in desperate need to see what real manhood is and what real uh, femininity really is. Uh, thank you for watching the program today. I'd like to invite you to be a part of Franciscan Uni University's mission uh, to educate, to evangelize, and send forth joyful disciples. Join us here on our campus for a, a degree and our education online for our, our programs. Join us at our summer conferences uh, for dynamic speakers and to be equipped for the new evangelization or to join us on pilgrimages. And finally, visit faithandreason.com for some great tools to go out and share the good news. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-783-6357.